detective goes to the scene of a crime and the body is his own and he begins to realize that there are other versions of himself occupying time space. At the most surface level, that's the plot of the film, but the film for me is much more about an interrogation of self. It's a hero's journey for somebody trying to find out who he is. I went to my dear friend and collaborator, George Nicholas, and I said, we just have to start shooting. You don't wait for an entire plan to emerge. You follow an impulse. You follow a, a shaft of light across the street. You let the art emerge and you don't know where it's going and you just lean into that. I was immediately hooked, and I said, this is a great premise. And I'd seen Gabe's work. He has such a unique visual style. You know how sometimes you just meet somebody and you're like, this person has more talent in their fingernail than most famous people in Hollywood. It was almost like, you know, my dad has a barn and I've got some lights, let's, let's have a show. I had access to equipment. Gabe had a little bit of money saved up. We met one day, just George and I on Coney Island. He is somebody who knows my palate and my sensibility and keeps me honest. We were shooting 35 millimeter short ends, shooting a videotape, washing up on the beach. I didn't have a full script at the time. I just had images in my head that I had to get out. Crazy visions. I started engaging actors. First, it was Greg Bedick, who plays John Luca. He saw me street performing along with him when he first got his start. We did a two-day shoot in a spray room in New York. Shooting what seemed to be very nonsensical. And I wanted to make a film the same way a painter makes a painting. About a year into the process, Eduardo Ballerini signed on. As a producer. Let's go. Let's do it. Eduardo brought me this script. And every so often, something skips across your desk that is special. With good writing, there isn't that much puzzling that needs to be done. The movie started coming together. We fell in love with it, and we just thought it was so crazy and so genius, we had to be involved. The script is sophisticated. A little bit of money came in. So I was brought in to kind of physically produce this thing, find crew. The first thing that comes to mind when I read the script is Inception. Primer, oh, that's close. And there's a lot of 12 monkeys. Eduardo Ballerini is able to bring this luminance, yet transparency, to this role. Immensely talented. Who's one of the stars of Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire. And what he's doing is really incredible, and yet very subtle. You know, he became these different characters. Distinct, different characters. At once malleable, dexterous. And then entourage star, Emmanuel Shriki. Emmanuel, I know, was particularly intrigued with the role. The dream as an actor is always to just be doing interesting stuff, especially in the indie realm. She was the most lovely down to earth person. I really love the transformation her role goes through, and she was able to play that with such plomb and subtlety. Austin Pendleton's a huge star. He's performed opposite Meryl Streep, worked with Sidney Lumet. He's like the ultimate teacher master. Greg Bennick, I think, is going to be one of the most wonderful surprises in this film. He's a ball of energy, he's a ball of fun. And I remember thinking if I could just capture this, it would be like sort of capturing lightning in a bottle. Lynn Cohen is a great actress. You know, he's worked with Spielberg. Al Sapienza plays Tim's. He's amazing to work with. Three full weeks of production in New York. Everybody just put their heart and soul into this movie. We weren't there for the money. We were there to make this film. We had a great team. And we just became a family very quickly. It really feel like it's a family element to this. It starts from the top and it feels it throughout the rest of the group. This set is more friendly, more happy. I love this group. I love them so much that I gave them each nickname. I feel like the less money you have, kind of the more you have to really come together. Absolutely want to help each other out. I've worked with the Grip Electric guys, obviously not my department. By the seat of our pants, a big roll of duct tape, and a lot of asking for permission after. <laughs> In all my films, I try to avoid the specificity of actual time and place. We didn't really want any of it to look like Brooklyn. I think I've always been influenced by the idea of art being a sort of mythology. The production value has to be very high for something like this. The production value of it is so insane. If I had to use one word, I'd say steampunk. The world is very varied in this film. We had amazing locations. We had uh, Angel Orange Sands. Synagogue that had been built in the 1860s. A mansion up the Hudson River. I would read one character's lines, and then I had a secret earpiece. We were in a bowling alley, and the earpiece failed. The most frightening moment of the production was filming the naked scenes on Long Island. The street that we were filming on wasn't locked down. Cars would drive down the road with, <laughs> with the family on vacation all of a sudden. I was pushing the dolly with my face while Gabe furiously poured a bucket of water into a funnel on a C-stand 
part of the shoot that we did not have a handle on was this flying machine. What we're talking about is very similar to rock climbing technology. The funniest moment was being strapped against a green screen in a flying contraption. Whatever you do, it cannot cost more than $200. There's nothing that looks like this film. It is shot so beautifully. It's also made on different formats. We started out in 35 millimeter film. There is the graininess of 16 millimeter film. There's the super graininess of eight millimeter film. We shot reversal, digital, Polaroid. Frame grabs that were then printed on an inkjet printer, painted on, re-photographed in 16 millimeter with a Bolex camera. My Darren and, you know, scratches and... Memory is predicated by what your childhood photograph was shot on. The film, in talking about memory, also plays with the medium of film itself. It's a film about time travel, but memory itself is a sort of time travel. Filmmaking is also a way that we time travel. You are constantly manipulating time when you're making a film. It's being spliced and splintered, so the film in being about time travel is also about cinema itself. In some ways, the film is an elegy for celluloid. From the day we started this production to now, I have three children who are, you know, in elementary school. Post-production was the hardest part. We had a long, arduous editing process, and after doing a cut that was more linear, we realized it wasn't working fully. I think I went and watched some Tarkovsky and, and came back and tried to just fragment the whole thing. Gabe did a lot of the VFX work himself. Some of our effects are deliberately lo-fi, Melius, you know, Voyage to the Moon. I helped bring in some investors and effects partners. Those guys with the help of some other freelance effects artists were able to help us finish the film and complete 300 visual effects shots. The sound design for Seven Splinters was an absolutely critical element, and we had the good fortune of finding Michael Flannery, who is a true artist. He used vintage and modular synths and really went the extra mile. In composing and recording the score, I listened to a lot of influences, whether it was Bernard Herrmann's jazz film noir scores to electronic music scores to avant-garde music. I was really trying to incorporate a lot of different influences, but I wanted to make sure that the horns were real horns and the strings were real strings. He rented a cello and learned to play cello. We recorded a lot of the core material for the film with my jazz trio, Daniel Jodeci and Miles Wick, phenomenal musicians. And we just went into a recording studio and played some of the themes that I written almost like jazz charts. Go again. And then from there, those became the stems from which I built larger tapestries. We made something that nobody thought we could make. If you look at the, the huge sci-fi films that come out in Hollywood, I think we compete with those films literally like we were one day's lunch budget. But it looks big. It looks like it cost a lot. Wait, it's not just an indie, but it's like a micro indie. It's like a handmade film. Gabriel is one to watch. Tons of references to movies. Chris Marker, La Jetée, If You Like 12 Monkeys. To Godard's Alpha Bill, there's an animated scene with Akiva in it right out of Back to the Future. I think if people aren't familiar with Eduardo, they will be after this. When you start watching Seven Splinters in Time, at first you're like, really? Wait, what? Huh? Wait, wait who? By the end of the film, the payoff is an incredible surprise. It is, on one hand, a time travel psychological thriller. Part of it is about the identity crisis that modern individual has. What is it that becomes the driving force in our life? You know, what parts of our psyche do we want to cultivate and what parts do we want to repress? And it's a film about good and evil. In my opinion, uh, a nearly perfect exploration of the genre. It has a lot of heart. It has a strong emotional core. Very audacious, bold, challenging, visionary production. There are not many films like this in the world. Thank you.